Mount of Olives, uh, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to you, to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. <coughs> the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him um, and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee.
Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion will be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. And that's from Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 through 10. Many people look at these two events and erroneously assume that the prophet Zechariah, writing over 500 years before Jesus' birth, was predicting that one day Jesus would come along and ride into Jerusalem triumphantly. To assume this would be an erroneous interpretation of the message Zechariah brought to the people of Israel in his time and in his place, Zechariah, like all the prophets, was not predicting something that would one day occur. He was reflecting on the events that were happening in his time, in his day. Zechariah was writing in the time period when the exiled Jewish people were returning to Israel after the era of Babylonian captivity. The nation was in turmoil trying to figure out how to conduct itself after decades of captivity, captivity and how to assimilate their wayward children returning after two generations. This section of Zechariah's prophecy, in contrast to the first eight chapters, is written in a form of poetry, an artistic expression of the prophet's hopes and dreams for his homeland. As you read this hope-filled poem, the personification of the coming ruler is emblematic not of conquest, but of Zechariah's dream for peace. The king Zechariah describes is the antithesis of our worldly understanding of kingship. This king is humble, deflecting austerity and promoting peace. Six centuries later, Jesus commandeers this cultural understanding of a contrary monarch by utilizing Zechariah's dream to protest the actions of orthodoxy. Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, embracing not triumphalism, but the idea of peace that has been emphasized by Zechariah. If you continue reading the book of Zechariah, you will find contrasting understandings of peace and bloodshed, but the overarching theme is a poem about the restoration of the nation of Israel and the ultimate reign of peace that can be realized by the nation when arrogance and pride are put aside. But primarily, the book of Zechariah, or at least this section of the book of Zechariah, is about restoration of dignity. The dignity, value, and worth of the nation of Israel is envisioned decade after decades of disenfranchisement. Riding in humbly, dignity is restored. Consider the context of Zechariah. This vision was written around 520 BC. Sixty years earlier, an event happened that forever changed the landscape of religious experience and forever altered the faith life of the people of Israel. In 587, the nation of Babylon invaded Judah, destroying the temple in Jerusalem and taking the able-bodied young men and women of Israel into captivity in Babylon. Since the Jewish people believed the temple in Jerusalem was God's house, and to properly worship God, we must make an annual pilgrimage to that temple, Everything now had to be reevaluated. How can you maintain your faith with the temple destroyed? How can you maintain your faith with an occupying army controlling your affairs? And for those in exile, how can you maintain your faith if you are in captivity? And now, 60 years later, the captivity ends. The exiled Jews are allowed to return, and the nation is once again, well, in somewhat freer state. This is when Zechariah is sharing this prophetic wisdom. The nation was trying to define itself, absorb the returning exiles, and the political landscape was very polarized. Into this atmosphere, Zechariah injects his vision of peace. He imagines a peaceful monarch emerging, spreading God's wisdom far and wide. This monarch would break the weapons of destruction that had oppressed the people of Israel for so long and would spread God's message of peace from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Dignity would be restored to the nation and the reign of peace would begin. Like many political dreams, however, Zechariah's prophecy fell on many deaf ears. 
The nation embraced the cultural directives of expedience and pride, seeking dignity in worldly ways rather than humility. And the nation of Israel never again became the confident body politic that Zechariah envisioned. By the time Jesus rode into Jerusalem, more than 500 years after this dream, the nation was occupied once more. Now besieged by the Romans, the reality of oppression had become part of the national identity, and the restored dignity of the house of Jacob seemed like only a dream. Moreover, although the temple had been destroyed, well, as long as the temple had been restored, it was restored under Roman supervision with Roman influence and caveats. God's home was restored in a way, but Herod's temple was not the same as Solomon's temple. Even the temple, the center of life for Jewish faith, was the subject of some discontent. The people whom Jesus ministered to most intimately were in an awkward place. Their faith life and their homeland were quite unsettled, and their dignity was lost. This was the scene when Jesus entered Jerusalem that day. The day that some like to call the triumphal entry. By this time, much of Israel felt hopeless. The dreams of Zechariah and others far from realization. Was there any possibility of peace in Roman-occupied Israel? But Jesus resurrected those dreams. Embracing the dream that Zechariah shared 500-plus years earlier, Jesus embodied that vision and used it in his political protest. Embodying the vision of Zechariah, Jesus sought to restore hope to the hopeless and show them that there is always another way. The way of humility and peace is the long game. And just as the Babylonian occupation crumbled, so too would the Roman Empire. There is hope for dignity restored in line in Zechariah's dream. Now, I don't like to call this a triumphal entry, as some of you may have inferred by what I said a minute ago. Calling it this imposes a cultural translation that misses the entire point of this story. This is not about the arrogance of triumph. This is about the enduring quality of hope. Jesus is not realizing triumphs over anyone or anything. In fact, this event ultimately leads to his, his crucifixion. What Jesus is doing is resurrecting the enduring dream of peace, a dream that we still seek today. Jesus' embodiment of Zechariah's dream is not about triumph, it's about hope. This is not the triumphal entry today, this is the hopeful entry. The sense of hope is what Jesus brought to the Jews today. Hope that the peaceful dream of Zechariah could be realized. Hope that a more authentic understanding and expression of faith was possible. Hope that their dignity would be restored. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem that day brought hope. And this is the message that we are called to proclaim as well, embodying it in the way we ride into the cultural situations of our world and express our understanding of faith. People of faith in this time and place have a choice of expressing their faith victoriously or expressing their faith hopefully. For many in the world, victorious expressions of faith are the norm. Christian exceptionalism is one example of this victorious mindset, where binary situations are created that says Christianity is touted with arrogance as the only way, and anyone who does not follow a prescribed path to Jesus is doomed. The prosperity gospel is another example of using, using faith for a victorious, triumphal message rather than a hopeful message. Unscrupulous preachers like the ones you may see on TV when you stay home on a Sunday morning that it snows. <laughs> Preach that if you have enough faith, you can triumph over the rest of the world and live in prosperity. And as an expression of that faith, just send them money. Wealth is seen as triumph. And if you're not wealthy, you must not be faithful enough. Over the past two millennia, people in the church have twisted this message of Jesus into one of victory triumph rather than hope. And while faithful disciples of Jesus pray that Jesus' message of peace and the restoration of dignity for all of God's children is realized in the world, that message will not be realized by embracing a mindset of binary exclusion, adopting a win-lose mentality. Faith cannot be imposed by the victorious. If so, it's not faith. 
Only when our expressions of faith are about hope, not victory, will Jesus' message be fully realized in the world. That's what I find so joyful about our church's decision to proclaim ourselves an open and affirming congregation. That proclamation is not about exceptionalism over others, about prosperity over others, about victory over others. It's not about exceptionalism or triumphalism. It's not about binary division or polarization. It's about humility, just as Jesus taught us today. And it's about restoration of dignity, as Jesus advocated as well. Most of all, it is about hope that binary opposition may be eliminated so that all may be affirmed as worthy children of God. Zechariah had a dream for the restoration of dignity for those who were being disenfranchised. Jesus had a dream for the restoration of dignity for those who were being disenfranchised. We too, as a congregation, have articulated our dream, the hope-filled Palm Sunday dream of Jesus, the post-exilic dream of Zechariah, that all may be one, affirmed and loved. There are those who say that pastors should avoid saying anything political. People who say that really, people who say that may not have a very articulate understanding of who Jesus really was, because Jesus was one of the most political players this world has ever seen. This event today, this staged protest on a donkey, was a calculated political maneuver on Jesus' part. Knowing that Pontius Pilate was going to parade into Jerusalem that week in a chariot driven by regal war horses, arriving during the Passover, not to celebrate it, but to oversee it and supervise it and uh, condemn it in many ways. Jesus pulled an imagery from an esteemed Hebrew prophet to stage a political demonstration. Protesting Pilate and the mindset of the Jewish people was a calculated political risk and Jesus took it to further his faith-filled agenda. While Pilate made the triumphal entry, Jesus in protest made the hopeful entry. May we ever embrace the wisdom of Jesus' expression of faith, restoration of dignity for the oppressed, and hope for all of God's children. Amen. Would you please